All right, well, let me uh, do a few things to kind of introduce um, what's going to go on and, and how this is going to work. Um, those of you that uh, are new, don't know me, my name is Moses Lotus. I am the facilitator uh, of this group. Uh, and today we are on the final part of a lecture series that we've been doing for the last few weeks. Uh, this is our Sex, Singleness, and Marriage Seminar. Uh, we try to do this at least once a year now, at least we've done it three, this is our third year actually uh, doing this. Um, not bad, a little tradition kind of going on with it. Uh, but the reason, uh, the reason why we're doing this, uh, one, uh, the world is always talking about all of these topics. The world always has something to say about marriage. Okay, the world has something to say about singleness, as we saw last week, and the world has a lot to say about sex, period. Okay, in the culture that we live in, in the world that we live in, in the society that we live in, uh, it's everywhere. Okay, so uh, the world has something to say about it. Uh, two, the church is virtually silent on it. I, I hate to say it, but the church has been. I mean, the church is starting to, you know, see the need to address it a bit, and some people have handled it uh, competently, and others have ended up glorifying sex just as much as the world. So it's important that the church does uh, address this, because if the church isn't talking about it, again, the world is, period. And the world doesn't turn off. It's on 24-7, okay? From music that we listen to, TV, all that kind of stuff, it's there, it's, it's on, okay? And that leads to the third point why we're talking about this, is because it just gets assumed that Christians, you know, well, you grow up in a, in a church, you grow up in a Christian home, and it just kind of gets assumed that Christians just know about this, that somehow this knowledge just gets infused, or, you know, uh, they put the Bible on their head, and the knowledge just kind of flows in, you know, supposedly, but it gets assumed. And then so when Christian leaders fall, you know, when the sheep fall, uh, you know, we kind of look at them and it's like, well, didn't they know? You know, didn't, you know, shouldn't they have known? And a lot of times, you know, because we assume it, it, a lot of times it really is the case. They didn't know. They didn't know what was so special about marriage. They really didn't know what was so special about singleness, and they really didn't know and don't know what is so special about sex. And so it's important that we do have, uh, that we, as Christians, that we do have a Christian way of thinking about these things. And so that's the perspective that these are all going to be approached from, uh, basically that God has spoken about these things. So the way this is going to work, okay, uh, if you guys haven't got a handout with notes, uh, you can probably raise your hand and we can get those passed out to you, but these are just uh, years for note-taking. The way this is going to work is that I'm going to lecture and lecture and lecture and lecture because I have been given the gift of gab, okay, that is a real gift, okay, and uh, I will lecture for about 45 minutes to an hour or so. Uh, any questions that you guys have, save them for the end, okay? And then what we'll do is afterwards, uh, I'll pull up my little comfortable stool because I'll be tired of standing by then, and uh, we'll address any questions that you guys might have uh, about this topic. Or if you guys want to uh, go back and discuss issues, I guess, relating to marriage and singleness, we can kind of do sort of like a summative Q&A uh, about this whole thing. I will pray, and then we'll, we'll dive in here. <clears throat> Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Triune God, Lord, we come to you tonight, Lord, as your people, Lord, uh, but also as sinners, Lord, as sinners living in a fallen world, as sinners with our, with our own fallen thoughts, with our own traditions, Lord, and, and carrying influences uh, from many different places, Lord. Lord, we seek your wisdom tonight. We seek your perspective. We seek your will. We seek ways that we can glorify you, Lord, as our creator, and especially, Lord, as our redeemer. Grant us your grace tonight and grant us the Holy Spirit, Lord, that we may uh, grow uh, in wisdom, Lord, and that we may approach this uh, in light of the gospel and in light of everything that Jesus Christ has done for us. It's in his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Our culture is absolutely infatuated with sex. Our culture is steeped in sex. It is knee-deep in sex. It is up to here in sex. If you don't believe me, just turn on the radio, see how long it takes for any song to come on that will make an allusion or an explicit, uh, uh, explicit lyrics to sex. It, it doesn't take very long, and it doesn't matter what station it is, okay? It can be the Tejano station, it can be the country station, it can be the hip-hop station, it can be the rock and roll station, okay? It doesn't matter the station. It's there. 
Turn on the television, almost any sitcom, any TV show, any movie, the sex is there. It's there, period. Okay, it's just one of those things that we kind of uh, have to deal with, we have to see, okay, and it doesn't have to be the explicit act either. Okay, the enticement to sex uh, is, is in the guy uh, who has either the great body, I don't know who's hot out there to look at, I haven't been, been keeping up with TV lately. Okay, uh, you know, gentlemen, it was in the Super Bowl, Beyonce. <laughs> there it was for the guys. And there it was, there was a display. It's in the scantily dressed woman. I mean, uh, again, all you have to do is Beyonce and everybody, the Super Bowl image is just coming in everybody's mind. Okay, bam, there, <laughs> there it is, it's there, okay. We know the kind of power that she wields uh, over every male who wanted to be with her at that moment and over every female who wanted to be like her. <clears throat> it's in magazines, it's in commercials, uh, it's everywhere. Sex sells, okay? Sex sells, it's in advertising. Sex promises things. Our culture is overwhelmed by the allure of sex. Pornography is one of the biggest industries in our nation. Christians are overwhelmed by sex in the culture as well. In fact, Christians have even yielded to the sexual ethics of the culture. The Christian dating scene is unfortunately no better in this area than the rest of the culture. We're losing. We're just like them. We're not any different. There's no power in the religion that we claim if it doesn't have power over our sex lives. We've been tricked into thinking that sex is the way that you tell somebody that you love them instead of marrying them. Now it's sex. We've been duped into thinking that we somehow need sex, that there's this biological drive for sex, that you have to have it. FYI, nobody ever died from not having sex. I just needed to say that. The Bible has a lot to say about sex. Okay? Uh, it has a lot to say about sexuality, more than we know, more than we give it credit for. In fact, the Bible actually talks about sex more than some people would like to admit. Books like the Songs of Solomon can be rather embarrassing for very conservative Christians at times. But the Bible is not ashamed of human sexuality. In fact, as we will see, the Bible has a lot to say about human sexuality and about sexual ethics in our culture today. So, I want to share with you guys two reasons why I believe the biblical view of sex is worth preserving. I want to give you guys a few reasons in this lecture about what the Bible has to say about sex and I want to tell you basically what is so special about sex from a Christian perspective. So that is what makes uh, the, the biblical uh, sex ethic, ethic okay, basically in, in a sense to the world, despite its lameness, okay, what makes it worth saving. And that's going to be the point. So, let's begin with a decently lengthy passage about sexuality in the church. Okay, uh, this is going to come from uh, the first letter to the Corinthians. Corinth, if you guys know, was a very, very troubled church. Okay, if you read through that letter, you know, you, you start seeing uh, uh, he was sleeping with his who? You know, you, you had a guy that was sleeping with his stepmom, and you're like, what in the world is going on in that church? So they had a lot of questions, nonetheless. They, they had a lot of things that they wanted to know about, and one of the questions that they had uh, uh, were, they were about sex, and they were about sex in marriage and sex outside of marriage. So, if you would, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses uh, 12, all the way through 7, 5. Okay? All the way through 7, 5. What was that again? 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verses 12 all the way through chapter 7, verse 5. <clears throat> this is the Apostle Paul. He says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. 
Every other sin a person uh, a person commits is outside the body, but the sexual immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should, also, should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to the husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now, there's a lot going on here, but a few thoughts will start to kind of open up the text for us and help us to understand this. Okay, uh, First, the cultural context in which Paul wrote to. Okay, In the ancient world, and even today, there were roughly two views of sex that had emerged in the thinking of the people. Okay, The first was what has come to be known as a Platonic view, okay, which I am going to call the low view, okay, which basically taught that sex was rather dirty and defiling because it was a physical thing. In Platonic sort of thinking, okay, uh, the physical or our bodies were this sort of cage or they were this prison for our soul or for our spirit, okay, uh, which was the part of us that mattered. Okay, it was the soul aspects that, uh, that mattered. All right. Now, hence, the body, again, it was considered a prison for the soul, but the body was also, uh, it was either a thing to be despised or a thing to be escaped from. Okay. Hence, religions and cultures with this sort of view teach that sex should be engaged in uh, rather sparingly and mainly for procreative purposes only. Okay. So you'll find traces of that, in one sense, in Roman Catholicism. Okay. That sex is basically only for procreation, and that's about it. It. That's what it's for. Other than that, abstain from it, stay away from it. You only do it if you have to, and that's to make babies. The other view that developed alongside alongside this was what we uh, what is called like the sex as appetite view. Okay, and we're going to call that the middle view. Okay, sex as an appetite. This tended to develop among a lot of the mystery religions, like in Baalism and in Gnostic circles. And this view, much like when a person gets hungry and eats. Okay, when a person uh, gets aroused, they have an appetite for sex, they just go and have sex. And so a lot of these mystery religions, they had temple prostitutes. And that's what was there in Corinth. They had to deal with that in the Old Testament. Uh, the Baals, when they worshipped the Baals, the idea was that they had to kind of uh, spur uh, uh, the gods uh, to fertility. And if they could spur the gods on to basically to make love to each other... Uh, the ground would produce crops and stuff like that. So how did they arouse the gods? They went and had sex with temple prostitutes. And that's pretty much where these, uh, this sort of view on sex uh, developed from. Okay. So in this view also, sex was used for just about anything, from pure sensual pleasure to manipulation, including favors in return for almost anything. This view in particular is highly rampant in our culture. You see it all over TV from Jer Jersey Shore and the situation, okay, and his little famous phrase that he has to popular TV shows, movies, and music. Sex is a thing to be used. It, it, it's a product. It's, it's something that you enjoy. It's a ride that you pay for and you get on it as many times as you want and, you know, you can do it whenever you want, whenever you feel the need. That's basically uh, how it's portrayed, okay? It's what spring break has become about. It's what downtown McAllen has become about. It's what college is about for some people. It's what being single has become about. And it's in both men and women. It is rampant in the hookup culture that is uh, just all around, period. <laughs> it is rampant in that. One night stands in this view or they're the thing. It's what the pornography industry plays or displays about sex as well. Okay, It's just something to be used. People are just products to be used. You just go, you have your good time, and that's it. You're done. You feel the need? Go. We see it as people use sex outside of marriage as a quote-unquote training ground for whenever you get married, whatever that means, 
Okay, statistics actually show that sex outside of marriage never prepares you for sex in marriage. It's way different. This view of sex can be at worst animalistic as people just move from partner to partner. At best, and I'm saying that with all sarcasm and in all quotes, okay, uh, it's consumeristic. Treating people uh, as products to be used and discarded whenever a better deal comes along. This view of sex I want to propose is the most damaging psychologically and the most damaging spiritually as well. But this is the world in which Paul spoke to. It's the same world that makes the words of the Bible so relevant to us today. It, it's, it was the world uh, in which the Bible uh, spoke to and it still speaks today. So let's begin with some broad strokes about sex, about what the Bible has to say about it. So let me say first. One, God created sex. Okay? God created sex. The origin of sex takes us all the way back to the Garden of Eden in Genesis 2, in which God commanded Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply. That's Genesis 1.28. Okay? To be fruitful and multiply. Assuming that sex was not a result of the fall, and that man did not multiply by feeding them after midnight. I hope I got that rule right from Gremlins. Did anybody catch that? Okay, I think that's the right rule. You don't feed them after midnight, or that's what happens. That's that's so uh, that's the one. I knew I messed up somewhere. Okay, uh, but uh, assuming that that's not the case uh, with humans, okay, sex was part of God's original design. It was part of His creation. It was part of what God meant when he said that a man shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife, and the two would become one flesh, in Genesis 2.24. In this sense, then, sex was created as good. Okay? In fact, the command to be fruitful and multiply would have to include in there the command to have sex. Okay? So that's, uh, part of that, that's part of our second point. Okay? Sex was originally created as good. Sex was a good thing. It was created the way that it was also, with all the wonder and all the pleasure of it by design. Those are not accidental parts of the way it works. We'll get to the purpose of that in just a moment. Okay? But thirdly, we should say that sex is a gift from God. It's a gift from God to humanity to be enjoyed. And again, the Bible is hardly prudish at all when it comes to sex. Okay? Songs of Solomon. Okay, it stands as witness to that. And I hope you guys will be here for us uh, with that uh, as we go through that next week. Okay, but also passages like Proverbs 5, 18 through 19, which I will not read here. But I will merely raise your curiosity, but I'm sure a few fellas in here are going to have that as their life verse when tonight is over. Okay, however, even though sex was created as a good thing, it was designed by God, it was tainted by sin. The fall not only messed up uh, the way the uh, human relationships work, but it also messed up what sex is for as well. So we've already seen the two ways in which sin reacts to the good gift of God. One is to despise it. Okay, so that's the platonic or the low view. It just, it's dirty, it's defiling, I don't like doing that. Okay, to kind of just, ah, I hate to do it, but if we don't, well, we all die. <laughs> the world, everybody just ceases to exist because you don't have any kiddos. Okay? But the other view, or the other, the other way that sin distorts it is to deify it, is to idolize it, is to turn it into, into something more pleasurable than God himself, and that's the sex's appetite. Okay? Or again, the middle view. Both of these views are not biblical, and they are not in accord with Christian teaching about sex. So as we go through 1 Corinthians 6, 12 through 18, okay, uh, we're going to dismantle first the sex's appetite view so that we can see what is so special about sex. So, in 1 Corinthians 6, 12 through 16, Paul, he begins here to destroy the sex as appetite view, okay, that is that, uh, uh, the view that we should be free to engage in sex whenever and with whomever we want, for whatever reasons we want. Again, listen again, he says this, he says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food. God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality. So he's going back to design here. Well, why was food created? Food was created for the stomach, so you can get your nutrients and all that stuff as it goes through the digestive process. That's what it was created for. Okay, but 
the body was not created for sexual immorality. And he says here, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. Now, what is Paul saying here? He's basically saying this. He's basically saying you cannot treat your sexuality the way that you treat your appetite. You cannot treat your sexuality the way that you treat your appetite. While you may you may eat and have no uh, sp- uh, you know that has no spiritual effect on you. Nobody here gained ten points of holiness by eating pizza, and nobody here lost five points of holiness for having the glazed donuts. Okay. <laughs> It makes no difference what you eat in, in that sort of sense. It doesn't affect you in that sort of way. Okay? However, okay, what you do with your sexuality, Paul is saying, does affect you spiritually. It does affect you spiritually. This sin, okay, uh, this sin with the body will damage your soul. Why? As Paul begins to reason with the Corinthians, he takes us again. He takes us all the way back to Genesis 2.24, to the original purpose of the sexual union with man and woman. He says that they become one flesh. They become one body. What is that all about? That's important to understand. Authors Gerald Highstand and J. Thomas, they said here, until we understand why God created sex, we will never sufficiently make sense of his commands regarding sexual purity. For his commands always relate to his purposes. In other words, if, if we don't know and understand what sex is for, okay, and what happens every time we have it, then the mere command, uh, thou shall not commit adultery, or the mere uh, commands, uh, no sex outside of marriage, basically the law, the law isn't going to cut it. The law isn't going to cut it. I mean, let's face it, Christians who have fallen in this area knew the commandment. We know what it says. We read the Ten Commandments. We know them. I mean, it's not like, you know, when we have fallen, it's not like, thou shalt not commit adultery just suddenly popped up out of nowhere. Like, oh, yeah, 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 that's now true. No. You know, but again, the problem, and this is the problem of the law, and Paul says it in Romans 7, the problem of the law is that it's powerless to give you, you know, to lead you to obedience. The law is not meant to do that. The law, it, it points out your sin, it identifies your sin, and, and Paul even says that, you know what, the law, it provokes us to sin when we hear it. It pokes at our sinful nature, and our sinful nature, as it hears, you know, thou shalt not commit adultery, you know, our sinful nature inside says, I want to commit adultery. I want to break that law. That's, that's how rebellious our hearts are. I mean, I, uh, I teach. And the one thing that they teach us in, in, in teaching is you don't give the negative, okay? You don't tell, you know, um, in, in the gym, I, you're not supposed to tell the students, hey, don't play with the jump rope, because what's the first thing they do? Play with the jump rope. Why? Because the law provokes them to rebellion. The law provokes them to sin. So the law doesn't have the power to do that. So, so this, is, this is why we need to understand what it's for, not just stay away from it and then leave it at that. That won't help you. That won't help you, and you'll find, uh, if you have fallen in that way, that'll only bring further condemnation on you. It'll only bring further condemnation on you, but, and that's part of what the law does. Is it's meant to point out sin. It's meant to expose sin. We wouldn't know sin, Paul says, if it wasn't for the law. The law is a flashlight, but it's not a fix-all, okay? It doesn't fix it. It just shows you the problem. It's just a diagnosis. It's not the solution. In Genesis 2.24, the product or the result of sexual union is that it makes the partners one flesh. What does the Bible mean by one flesh? Without going into all the details, it basically means that they become one in person. Okay? It means that they become so closely knit together that they have, uh, in a sense, become one with each other. You can see that in Genesis 2.24, as you know, the context in, in which uh, the one flesh union is enjoyed. It's enjoyed among those who are naked and not ashamed. That is how connected that they are, okay? That they can be that open with each other. And in marriage, you know, uh, what that starts to look like is that you start to think like each other. 
you know what, what your spouse would be thinking even when they're not there. That's basically in, in, in practicality what it looks like to become one flesh is that you know them inside and out. You know how they think and they start to change you and you start to change them. That's what it looks like. Okay, but uh, but the context, you know, there is they're naked and they're not ashamed. They are in marriage. That is to say that God's intention for sex was to be the fullness of an expression of intimacy and a transparency in all areas of life. Sex is meant to be enjoyed with a person in which you are you are able to be naked and not ashamed, which is to say to be intimate with someone in all levels, including psychologically, uh, emotionally, intellectually, financially, spiritually, and whatever other levels you can think of. Okay, And again, we go back kind of to marriage. What was marriage for initially? It was to solve the problem of loneliness. It was to have deep, long-lasting friendship with someone. So being naked and not ashamed is actually part of the foundation for a good marriage and it's a safe place for physical nakedness. Why? Because sex is, is, is basically sex is a very powerful way of revealing the deepest parts of yourself. It's a very powerful way of revealing your innermost being to someone. That's the way that it was created. That's the way that it was created designed it, it was designed in such a way uh, so that it fosters uh, nurture uh, uh, and commitment that's what it does Tim Keller has pointed out in, uh, in a lecture and in his book the meaning of marriage that sex functions as what he likes to call covenant cement sex as covenant cement that is sex is an act that is for full, a fully committed relationship, okay, uh, marriage, basically a boyfriend or girlfriend is still not quote unquote fully committed, okay, but the act helps to cement the relationship together, okay, and that's why, you know, uh, traditional, they've, they've usually said that sex consummates the marriage, okay, that's part of the tradition with that, okay, uh, but that is to say it's a way of communicating of saying to somebody, I devote myself, I give myself completely and 100% to you. In this way, because marriage is a covenant, sex functions uh, as covenant cement. Okay, uh, That is to say, it's basically, it's a continual application of this cement, or this glue that continues to bring these people together. Okay, It's a continual application of cement, so that before you know it, you know, I guess it kind of, uh, snowballs or, or, or the structure, the, the you know what holds them together, just keeps getting stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger, and that's basically that's why you see sex commanded in First Corinthians seven one through five. That's part of why it's there, because the physical union it's the culmination of being united socially, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, etc. Again, to uh, to say to somebody basically. I only want physical nakedness, but I don't want to be vulnerable or accountable to you on any other level, okay, and this is the no strings attached view, okay, or the friends with benefits view, is basically a way of saying this, I don't want to give up my freedom, and I don't want to give up my self-centeredness, and I don't want to become vulnerable to you beyond your body. That's what having sex outside of marriage is essentially communicating that's what Paul is trying to say is that you're denying the one flesh aspects of what sex is supposed to symbolize of what it's supposed to mean sex functions as this unitive act whether you want it to or not it functions this way whether you want it to or not that is you can't say I really you know don't have any strings attached they're there because that's just the way it was designed. That's the way we were designed. We can't, uh, we can't get around that. Okay. Even at a neurobiological level, uh, this is proven to be true. And this was, uh, this was surprising, some research that I did uh, a couple of summers ago. Uh, recent research has shown that in sexual activity, uh, particularly in males, uh, oxytocin and vasopressin, you guys don't need to know this for a quiz or anything, okay? But basically for men, these help men, uh, it helps to bind them to the object of their affection. Okay, and during sexual activity, and I'm being, being very broad here because uh, part of the study was done uh, as the effects of men uh, who are watching pornography and basically why it ruins their love life and why it ruins their marriages. Okay, and this is part of the answer. Okay, but during sexual activity, uh, as the chemicals they get released uh, into the brain, uh, they help to psychologically bind the man to whatever uh, is in front of him, be it another woman or an image on a screen or a magazine. 
this hormone operates basically what they've called the commitment hormone, if you've seen that. I, uh, there was an article on, MSN, on uh, yeah, MSNBC.com, uh, I want to say maybe, geez, maybe about six months ago or so. But that's what they were calling it. They were calling it the commitment hormone. Okay? Uh, other researchers have called it the cuddle hormone. Okay? And they point out that it has a significant effect in binding partners to each other in committed relationships. In committed relationships, they said that it also facilitates jealousy and rivalry to any who threaten the relationship with their partner. Okay? However, they did show that on singles, apparently, it has no, uh, no significant uh, effect. Um, now, um, why am I mentioning all this? neurobiology stuff, I'll be honest, I don't understand much of that uh, anyway, but basically it's because it, it shows that our bodies themselves are designed in accord with what Paul is saying here. Our bodies are designed according, you know, they, they're basically, they physically reflect what Paul is saying is spiritually true. <clears throat> if it's true then that the effects of sexual union are to bind two people together, then it is possible to develop inordinate attachments as well. It's possible to develop inordinate attachments, okay? In fact, to misuse sex, that is to engage in the sex's appetite view, is to misuse one's commitment faculty. If sex is a sign of commitment, every time you have it to somebody that you're not committed to, you're misusing and you are destroying your ability to commit to another person in the long run. <clears throat> if sex, if sex uh, is not only a sign of total commitment, but it also psychologically produces it, again, the more a person has sex outside of marriage, the more, in a sense, a person spreads himself thin. Okay, and they, they become committed to so many things that, that they become committed to nothing at all. But in becoming committed to many things, one actually becomes less committed. I mean, again, it affects everything. It affects how you do your work. It affects anything that you can commit yourself to, period. Not just love life, but even your social life. The more sex gets misused, the more we break our ability to commit. So, if you hear what Paul is saying here, then he's basically, when he says, don't you know, he's basically saying this, don't you know that if you use it that way, you're going to break it? You're going to break it. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? He's saying here that to be joined with someone sexually in which there is no openness, he's calling that a monstrosity. It doesn't make sense as, as God designed us and as God designed sex. Hence, when we misuse this powerful tool, when it comes under sin, the effects can be devastating to where we feel uh, defiled. Okay, When people engage in one-night stands and they wake up the next morning not knowing who they're with, why they're there, or what they did, or what was done to them, people can feel shame in a very, very deep way. In a very, very deep way. Because it's damaging because sex is intended to function within marriage as a commitment apparatus, and I'll, admit, I'll get to that in just a little bit, okay, but when it's misused, again, we break our commitment apparatus, and it ruins our, our ability to commit. And hence, the more we misuse it, uh, uh, you know, like what Paul's talking about here, we go against God's design in creation, and we ruin ourselves. And that's part of why he says, you, you sin against your body. You sin against your body. So, does it make sense why sex is so special? Does it make sense why something like viewing pornography is not, it's not just a private sin? It really does affect everybody else in society. It really does, and it starts with your household. And then that bleeds into work, and then that bleeds in every other place. <clears throat> Do you see why people are not marrying? Why they're not marrying as much as before? If the commitment apparatus has been broken by sex in the long run, remember the statistics that we looked at for marriage? A lot of people aren't getting married anymore. A lot of people are not getting married. Marriage is down. 
<clears throat> Hence the warning, flee from sexual immorality. And then note the reasoning that Paul uses here. He, again, he, he says every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. So contrary to popular opinion, trying to find fulfillment and happiness and satisfaction in the arms of someone you're not married to, that you cannot be naked and not ashamed with, will only leave you more broken and ultimately lonelier because of your inability to commit because your sign of commitment has become misused, it has become meaningless. It's like, you know, uh, the story of the, of the little boy who cried wolf. You cry wolf one too many times and, and you misuse that. Then when you really cry wolf, nobody cares. Nobody cares. It, it doesn't mean anything anymore. Those words have been so misused now. In her book, Sex and the Soul, Donna Freitas, uh, she charted nearly 1,500 students from across different colleges in the U.S. and she inquired basically about their sexual ethics. Uh, and those who were engaged in the hookup culture, uh, and she noted that they tended to experience more devastating consequences after having engaged in sexual activities. These are college students, and the reason is because the oneness that is supposed to be achieved, it just isn't there when it's all said and done. It isn't there. It might be there for a moment, but in the morning, you're still alone. In a few weeks, it could be a few months, maybe even years down the road, you know, depending how long maybe a relationship lasts, but in the end, it will leave your soul empty. But properly used in marriage, it brings two people together and it helps to keep them together. And again, that's why Paul's commanding it in 1 Corinthians 7. He's saying you, it, it needs to be there. It needs to be there. Or else Satan will, he will tempt you. Satan will use that against you. So the first reason why sex is special is sex is special because it is an expression of total commitment to someone. Sex is an expression of total, absolute commitment to someone. But there's more. There's something else that is special about sex that Paul mentions here. In verses 19 through 20, he says this, he says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within, within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. That is to say, what Paul is saying here is he's basically saying, remember the gospel. Remember the gospel. The gospel is what makes sex so important as well. But how? Well, let's go back to the one flesh language and recognize that Paul, he uses that same language in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 31 to 32. Okay, when he says that the original design of marriage, okay, which would include sex, is actually based on God's design of the union between Christ and the church. We covered this when we looked at marriage. Okay, but listen to Paul again. He says here uh, in Ephesians 5, 31, 32, he says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So there's Paul quoting Genesis 2, 24, quoting the, the original design. But then look what he says. He says about that. He said, this, is a, this mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. It refers to Christ and the church. Okay, that is the relationship between a husband and wife is analogous to the relationship between Christ, the bridegroom, and the church, the bride. In other words, what Ephesians 5, 31 to 32 is saying is that the gospel union between Christ and the church is really what the whole of marriage is pointing to. And if you follow the analogy here now in 1 Corinthians, okay, uh, the spirit that we have from God, okay, so again, keep the marriage analogy. The spirit that we have from God, uh, he's called the down payment uh, or the dowry in Ephesians 1, 12 through 13, okay, that's kind of like the engagement ring. The spirit is, in one sense, it's the engagement ring. The coming of Christ radically redefines, reshapes, and reorients how we understand marriage and sex. Okay, and, and I've said it before, but Jesus really does change everything. Jesus changes everything. <clears throat> Paul can't be more clear on the fuller sense of Genesis 2.24 and saying that it refers to Christ and the church, not only human marriage. 
Tim Keller, he puts it this way. He says that the joy and the ecstasy of sex is a foretaste of the intimacy and closure we will all get when we see God. That is, this is what uh, the, uh, the church has called down through history, the beatific vision. Looking at God face to face. I believe it's uh, 1, John, uh, 1 John 3 where it says that we shall see him as he is. That is one of the hopes that the Christian has is that we will actually one day see God. That we will be able to stand face to face with Christ. Sex only partially reveals the joy of God and the joy that we will have when we are finally with God. Again, Gerald Heistan and J. Thomas, they concur. They said this. They said, God created sex to serve as a living portrait of the life-changing spiritual union that believers have with God through Christ. God created the physical oneness of sex to serve as a visible image or a type of the spiritual union that exists between Christ and and the church that is the joy that is in sex that's just a dim hint of the joy that we have when Christ comes back a dim hint of the joy they will have in the new heaven and in the new earth as we're worshiping Christ so when sex when it's viewed through the gospel it allows us to look beyond the simple selfish ends of a temporary pleasure to a glimpse of eternal pleasures in the presence of God, okay, and, and, and in this sense, sex is like a sign. It's a pointer to something beyond itself. It points us to greater joy, greater pleasure, and greater intimacy, and a greater closure that can only come from God Himself. Even the most incredible sex in this world can still leave you empty when it's all said and done, because it's just a moment. It's just a fleeting moment, that's all it is. But if we understand that it's just a small hint of something to come, of something greater we can actually look at it correctly. We won't be allured to worship it or to think that that's all that we have in this life, that that's the only pleasure that's in this life. We won't worship it. We won't idolize it. The problem with our culture and sex is that we don't see it as a sign. We see it as an end. I mean, isn't this what plenty of people say? You know, that's what a lot of people think dating is all about, you know? Oh, well, I took her out on a date. I bought her a burger. Surely she owes me, you know, she owes me something tonight. And it's like, did you get her cheese? <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> you know, but everybody in, in the dating scene, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. You know, everybody expects to have sex, okay, uh, or, or they expect that they might have to give sex, okay? And yes, even on the first one, even on the first one, it's expected now. It's, it's horrible. But this only makes sex an idol. It's a false god. It's a pseudo-savior. If your first criteria even for a date or for a spouse is, I wonder how they are in bed, then you can be sure that sex is an idol. It's a very real idol in your heart of hearts. No matter how much you say God is enough, if your first thoughts are, I wonder how hot they are, I wonder how they are in bed, sex is an idol. God is not number one in a heart like that. If we as Christians, if we're willing to engage in sex outside of marriage, then sex is an idol, and it's possibly serving a deeper idol, okay? Uh, uh, but that's, that's not how Christians are meant to live. In the Bible, idolatry is often compared to sexual immorality, because as Christians, we are the bride of Christ. And when we go to other gods, to other things, to fulfill what God alone can fully satisfy, we are committing spiritual adultery. You can, all the prophets in the Old Testament... I'm reading Ezekiel right now, and he, uh, the prophet, he calls the people the people of whoredom. You read Jeremiah. And, I mean, can you imagine, I mean, in a church opening, a, uh, you know, opening up a sermon, all right, whores, open up your Bible, and, you know, but can you imagine, that's what these, that's what these guys did. And they wanted the people to feel the impact of what it was that they were doing when they were worshiping and serving other gods. And he called them that. God cares what you do with your sexuality. And the cure for this, again, it's not try harder. And it's not a mere stop it. That's the law. The law only serves to condemn as it exposes our sin, but the condemnation, that condemnation, it leaves no room for any other cure but one. The only cure is the gospel. That is the only cure. Now, to be absolutely clear, let me answer the question. What is the gospel? Let's make it explicit, okay? The gospel is a story about all that God has done in Christ, 
okay, since the beginning of creation, from the promise of the seed and the fig leaves in Genesis to the cross of Jesus Christ. It's about God becoming a man in Jesus. The gospel is about more than mere forgiveness. Okay, it's about the very righteous record of the perfect life of Jesus Christ that's given to you and that's counted as your very own. So that you're not, you're, when you appear before God, it's not just, oh yeah, you're forgiven and you're kind of at zero. It's also a declaration that says you are righteous and you're given like this unlimited uh, bank account, basically, that gets you in, that doesn't just keep you neutral. It actually gets you in. It's, it's about more than mere forgiveness. It's about Jesus receiving in and upon himself the very punishment, the exact guilt and shame of our sin that we deserved to make us one with him. To bring us to himself, it's a story, a true story, about a bridegroom who left heaven to redeem and secure a bride for himself, to glorify God, and to enjoy Him forever. In the Gospel, we find Jesus being for us and providing for us everything that we need in Him to live a fully satisfied life. That is the Gospel. That is part of what sex points to. That is what marriage points to. It points to the Gospel. So in a sex-crazed culture, how does the Gospel answer all of our needs? Okay, How does it answer the need of sex? Well, in sex... If you look at it, what are we basically looking for? We're looking for deep union with someone because our souls are longing for deep intimacy. That is, we want to be known. We want to be known. No human being can fully meet the needs of another human being. Okay, we talked about last week, you know, uh, uh, in marriage, you have two lonely, empty sinners coming together, and two lonely, empty people don't fill each other. Okay, they make bigger the void. <laughs> Okay, you get two sinners that come together, you don't get less sin, you don't get instant holiness, you get compounded sin. You add kids to that equation, and there's more sinners running around the house, everybody with their own little agenda. Another human being, they cannot solve all your problems. They cannot give you the lasting happiness that you're looking for at all. Only Jesus can give us the fullest union and closure that we are really seeking in the gospel, when we are being tempted to use sex uh, to meet something uh, uh, in us, and let me just say it because this is out there, this would include masturbation. Okay, Jesus is always better than the need that we are trying to meet with a temporary Savior. Jesus is always better than those temporary Saviors, than those little quick fixes. In Jesus, we find the most amazing acceptance never having to fear being rejected. He covers us with His own righteousness, the rejection that we fear He took. Jesus took that. And we can, in Him we are forever accepted. And so in one sense, people that are prone to fearing rejection, they'll use sex. They use sex as a way of being accepted. Okay, we can call it peer pressure, but sex becomes a tool. Sex becomes a tool. It becomes a way of, in a sense, uh, uh, keeping people in a relationship or attracting them to a relationship. But sooner or later, the, the sex, it won't cut it. Sex is special, and we need to remember that it is. Now, how do we begin to live this out? Okay, the, some practical aspects here. Okay, how can Christians, uh, how can we make a difference in our attitude towards sex and in our culture? How can we convey that there is something special about sex? Well... First, we have to have a solid understanding and faith in the gospel. That is primary. If you do not understand the gospel, you will not be changed by anything other than the gospel. You need to study the gospel. Don't think the gospel is something that you, that you, you, know, you started your, your, your relationship with and the gospel is something that you only believed uh, 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 July 21, 1997, and that's it, and then I don't need to believe it again. No, the gospel is something that you are continually believing all the way through the entirety of your Christian life. You have to keep on believing. You can't, you, it's not, I signed a card, therefore, bam, well, I believed the gospel 10 years ago. No. The gospel is something that you are continually believing in. You have to continually hold to it. I, uh, goodness, this is my third Tim Keller quote. I'm on a roll today. Uh, but the way he puts it, he says, is that the gospel is not the, the ABCs of Christianity. The gospel is the A to Z. You spend your entire Christian life 
understanding and really digging the gospel in deep. If you don't have that, you will not see deep change in your life. The sins that you're struggling, it's not just repentance alone that's going to do that. You can cry and weep and you know it. You don't change sometimes. What changes you? The gospel. The gospel, seeing what Christ did, looking at what he did, looking, looking at everything that he did on your behalf. If all you see is a big finger from heaven pointing at you and going, no, you will not be changed by that. You'll hide in shame. But if you see a cross, that makes a huge difference. That makes a huge difference in, in the way that you understand and that you live out the gospel. So you have to be, uh, you have to be soaked in the gospel. You have to be saturated in the gospel. You have to live and breathe the gospel. Without the gospel, uh, uh, attempting to live out the law, it's just going to prove frustrating. Uh, and for some who already have and continue to fail, uh, and the ones who don't fail uh, will basically grow in, in self-righteousness. Okay, it'll take you in two directions. Okay, I'm, oh, I'm so awesome because, well, I've never fallen in that way. You know, it's like, oh, great, we got Pharisees and tax collectors and sinners. Great. <laughs> you know, and, and those, are, those are two ways that we don't want. We want a gospel way. <clears throat> so, in the gospel, we learn also too, and so this is part of, uh, you know, what we present to the world. We don't live out the Christian sexual ethic in order to be Christian. Okay? We live it out because we are Christian. Because we are. We're not trying to earn heaven by, you know, by abs uh, abstaining. We're not trying to earn it. It's because you already have that change. You already have the fundamental principle in you. You already have Christ in you. Paul says, and he says it in the letter, he said, Remember, you were bought with a price. What is he pointing to? He's pointing to the cross. He's not saying, remember the commandment. Remember, you were bought with a price. That price was nothing less than the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when we find our pleasures and joy in the gospel, we'll begin to view our sexuality in a manner that is not degrading and not idolatrous. You know, it really does trip people out in the world. Uh, I guess because of some of my old experiences and, and then uh, now... Uh, seeing, uh, seeing some change in my life, but you know, it really does trip people out that um, that I basically I, I'm not looking to hook up. <laughs> you know, like don't you don't you need to go out? Don't you need to release? And it's like you don't know Jesus, do you? <laughs> you know, it, it just it really does make that much of a difference. You know, and all of a sudden, you know, they, then eventually, you know, these people they find themselves so empty, and then it's like you know. I, because uh, they call me Flotus at work, you know, it's like, Flotus, uh, how do you, you know, what's your thing, man? What's your secret? You know, I can't seem to stay away, and it gets me in all kinds of trouble, you know. Uh, what's the secret? And it's like the gospel. All I'm doing is living out the gospel. I'm living out the gospel. When we can look at it, not as something to slave for, Okay, or something that will fulfill us for a moment uh, but leave us empty in the end. But when we can look at it as a means of pointing us to the joy uh, of, our true, of the true fulfiller of our souls and the true giver of happiness and to him who, who has pleasures at his right hand forevermore, as the psalm says. Okay, that's Jesus Christ. Okay? That makes sex not only special to us but also precious in God's <coughs> eyes. And that is uh, what I call the high view of sex. And it's the view of sex that our culture desperately needs. <clears throat>